Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Israeli government spokesman Elon Levy, back from uh, Mediatora, New York. Apologies for my absence. This is day 152 of the October 7th war, day 152 that the hostages have been trapped in the Hamas terror dungeons. IDF fatalities since the start of the October 7 massacre remain constant at 586. No change since yesterday. Earlier this week, the UN Special Representative on Sexual Violence in Conflict, Pamela Patton, published her report finding clear and convincing information that the hostages trapped in the Hamas terror dungeons have been subject to rape, sexualized torture, and cruel, inhuman, and degrading treatment. Her team also found reasonable grounds to believe that the Hamas rapist regime perpetrated acts of sexual violence in multiple locations during the October 7 atrocities, including rape, gang rape, and necrophilia against the bodies of its murdered victims. The evidence of the Hamas rapist regime's widespread conflict-related sexual violence on 10-7 and since against the hostages has now been recognized by the UN's foremost authority on the matter. The State of Israel, therefore, is calling on the UN Security Council to designate Hamas immediately as a terrorist organization and to subject it to the same international sanctions regime as Al-Qaeda, the Taliban, and ISIS. Israel also calls for an urgent meeting of the UN Security Council to discuss the Special Rapporteur's report on Hamas's sexual atrocities and to issue a fierce condemnation of its sexual violence. If the United Nations fails to take these two essential steps, the masterminds of 10-7 will reasonably conclude that the UN is apathetic to Hamas's crimes against humanity, against Israeli civilians, and in particular against the hostages it is abusing right now as we speak. In its tacit complicity, the UN will bear indirect responsibility for encouraging further Hamas atrocities. Anything short of designating Hamas a terror organization and convening the Security Council to discuss that report and condemn Hamas will simply give the Hamas rapists a message. Keep going. Moving to the northern border, last night Iranian proxy Hezbollah launched a dangerous escalation with a massive barrage of rockets at the town of Kiryat Shmona, which, like the whole northern border, has been under an evacuation order for five months. I hope you've seen the footage from last night of Israel's missile defenses in action. It's really like the Battle of Hogwarts. Uh, IDF fighter jets struck a Hezbollah launch post in Taibeb, from which the launches were carried out. No state in the world would tolerate such a missile threat against its civilians, and we are working to degrade Hezbollah's illegal capabilities. We repeat our firm warning. Hezbollah must back off, or we will push it away. It must vacate the area south of the Litani River in accordance with UN Security Council Resolution 1701, or we will be forced to act to repel this ongoing and immediate threat to the lives of our citizens, both the ongoing rocket fire, the shelling of people's homes, and the threat that those civilians could be abducted into Lebanon. As far as we are concerned, after 10-7, every day that a terrorist army remains in control of neighboring territory is a risk level of October 6th. An update on the humanitarian situation. I want to clarify Israeli policy regarding humanitarian aid in the Gaza Strip after a flood of erroneous reports and statements. There are no limits, no limits on the amount of humanitarian aid that can enter the Gaza Strip. I repeat, none. In fact, Israel is encouraging donor states to send as much food, water, medicine, and shelter equipment as they wish, and we will facilitate its entry into the Gaza Strip. Over the past two weeks, an average of 102 food trucks have entered Gaza every day, and that's nearly 50% more than before Hamas started this war on October 7th. I'll repeat, more food trucks are now entering the Gaza Strip than before the war. Just yesterday, 2,735 tons of food entered the Gaza Strip, amounting to nearly three pounds of foodstuffs per person. And that's before the flour is baked into bread, and that does not include the airdropped supplies as well. By the way, it's a common misconception uh, that before Hamas declared war, there were 500 aid trucks entering Gaza every day. That's simply not true. There were around 500 trucks, and they included industrial supplies and construction materials, which for obvious reasons are not entering the Gaza Strip now.
there are no limits on incoming aid. And in fact, there is excess capacity at the Israeli crossings, both Kerem Shalom, where goods enter Gaza directly, and Nitsana, where they are inspected before going on through Rafah. Israel's crossings are able to scan 44 trucks an hour combined. They are being underutilized by donor states at the moment. And the best evidence of that excess capacity is that last week we hit a record 277 aid trucks a day, with 255 entering yesterday. So what's the problem and why do we have this misleading, uh, this misperception that Israel is somehow restricting aid into Gaza? The problem is distribution. The UN is struggling to distribute aid at the pace that Israel is letting it in. And the reason is that the UN relies on UNRWA, which is a Hamas front. That is why aid is piling up undistributed on the Gazan side of the crossing. And that is why Israel has been working on new strategies together with the private sector inside the Gaza Strip to get aid to the people who need it while making sure that Hamas cannot steal it. Just this morning, over a dozen food trucks made their way to northern Gaza in coordination with Israeli authorities. The sad truth is that the UN is failing to distribute aid because it relies on Hamas front UNRWA to distribute it and on Hamas for protection. In fact, I was shocked to see the statement from uh, Mr. Satterfield, uh, Mr. Satterfield at the uh, UN State Department just last week. I think the first time that foreign officials have admitted that until now, the United Nations has been relying on Hamas protection. Uh, of course, that's letting the fox into the chicken coop when we know that Hamas is stealing aid. The international officials pointing the finger at Israel are trying to scapegoat Israel for the UN's own failure, while Israel is urging the UN to activate more effective aid agencies, rely on alternative distribution mechanisms, and urging foreign states to send as much aid as they want. The state of Israel categorically rejects and condemns these efforts that feed directly into Hamas's propaganda war and are intended to save Hamas from the consequences of the war that it started. We will accept being scapegoated no longer. Finally, an update on Ramadan. Uh, at a meeting of all the security forces chaired by Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu yesterday, it was decided as follows, and this is the statement, Israel strongly safeguards freedom of worship for all faiths at all sites in Israel and especially on the Temple Mount. Ramadan is of course sacred to Muslims. Its sanctity will be upheld this year as it is every year. During the first week of Ramadan, the entry of worshippers to the Temple Mount will be permitted, similar to numbers in previous years. A weekly assessment of the security and safety aspects will be held, and a decision will be made accordingly. Israel, of course, wishes all our Muslim citizens and neighbors a Ramadan Kareem and a holiday full of self-reflection, compassion, and generosity in the embrace of their friends and families. It's the end of today's update. We'll now, of course, take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. First question on Ramadan from uh, Naomi Sherbell Ball uh, at the BBC. Um, how worried are you about tensions rising in Jerusalem during Ramadan? Um, we are, of course, familiar from experience, unfortunately, that Ramadan is often an occasion when extremist elements try to whip up and inflame violence. Uh, we are working to deter that and dissuade that. Uh, as I said, we will continue to facilitate access to the Temple Mount for worship, as in previous years. Uh, make clear that is our policy, and we'll of course work firmly against anyone determined to disturb the peace and interfere in peaceful worship. Thank you. Uh, question from AWP. How do you respond to the accusation leveled by Hamas against Israel regarding evading commitments to reach an agreement to end the war uh, in the Gaza Strip? What are the main challenges uh, you consider as obstacles to reaching a comprehensive agreement with Hamas? There will be no comprehensive agreement with Hamas. This war will end with the defeat of Hamas or with its surrender. That is the only way that the war can end after the horrific atrocities of 10-7. As we saw from the UN Special Rapporteur's report, those sexual atrocities included acts of necrophilia against the victims' bodies. This war will end with the defeat of Hamas 
or its surrender. As we do that, we are working to dismantle Hamas's military and governing system in the Gaza Strip, release the hostages, make sure that Gaza can never pose a threat to the people of Israel again. Those are the three goals of this war, our response to the war that Hamas started, uh, and we will continue to do that. Within that, we do want to see a temporary pause in the fighting for humanitarian purposes that will enable us to get hostages out. That was what happened in November. We had a hostage release pause that Hamas decided to terminate unilaterally and prematurely and stop releasing all the women and children. We want a framework that will see a temporary pause to get those poor hostages out. They've been stuck there for 152 days, but this war will end ultimately with the total defeat of Hamas or its surrender. The lesson of 10-7 is that we cannot accept the control of neighboring territory by a terrorist organization with openly and avowedly genocidal goals against our people. Thank you. Second question from AWP. Does Israel believe there is an opportunity to achieve a peaceful and lasting solution with the Palestinians in the near future? And connected to that, how do you envision, envision uh, the future of relations with Arab countries after the conclusion of the conflict? Israel, of course, wants to see peace with all of our neighbors around the region and our Palestinian neighbors. In order for that to happen, uh, the Palestinians need to give up their 100-year war against the Jewish people. They need to relinquish that war against any sovereign Jewish existence between the river and the sea. Uh, the Prime Minister has been clear with his 3D vision for peace with regards to Gaza that the prerequisites for peace are the destruction of Hamas, the demilitarization of Gaza, and the de-radicalization of Palestinian society. We cannot have another generation of Palestinian children being brought up on a diet of jihad and indoctrination, being taught to embrace violent struggle against Israel instead of embracing a future of peace with it. We want peace. That is why we are speaking about the need for de-radicalization in order to build a pathway towards peace. That is essential. It has to go through the Palestinians reconciling themselves with the permanent existence and legitimate right of the Jewish state of Israel to exist in safe and secure borders. And once that paradigm switch takes place within Palestinian society, the sky's the limit. Thank you. Question from Frederick Eger from Interplanetary, T uh, Interplanetary TV. According to reports by Sky News in Arabic on March 5th and by Ashak al Awsat in January, Yahya Sinwar has reportedly faced criticism an internal discord from, Hamas, from the Hamas leadership for unilaterally or authorizing the October 7th attack without consulting other Hamas leaders or the political bureau. Sources close to the Al-Qassam Brigade's Hamas military wing indicated that only five Hamas leaders, Sinwar's brother, Mohammed Sinwar, Mohammed Daif, Marwan Issa, and Yahya Sinwar were the decision makers uh, for the attack. Knowledge of the attack reached the larger circle of Hamas leaders, including Ismail Haniyeh, the political bureau, and Salah Ori, uh, only a few hours before the attack. Does Israel's government, based on its intelligence, reports and assessments, confirm or deny these reports that the launch of the October 7th massacre was the sole decision of Yahya Sinwar? Uh, we have no comment on classified intelligence matters, uh, but clearly it is horrific. Um, what a group of psychopaths brought on the people of the Gaza Strip by deciding to declare this needless war with a sadistic and brutal massacre and killing and raping spree and deciding to fight that war from inside densely populated areas under civilian facilities. I can't comment on who specifically knew about the order to declare war on October 7th. But the fact that Hamas has spent 16 years deliberately building a network of military assets underneath civilian areas with tunnel shafts poking out in schools, homes, hospitals and mosques, that was not a secret reserved to a select few in the Hamas leadership. It was a project that brought on bold the mass mobilization of uh, Hamas that dedicated tremendous resources and talent towards the October 7 
massacre. And whoever knew about the specific decision to declare war or not, uh, the sad fact is that the Hamas regime spent the last 16 years prioritizing the military machinery of the October 7 massacre instead of using the opportunity of Israel's withdrawal in 2005 to build a peaceful and prosperous future for the Palestinian people. Thank you. A uh, question from Yusuke Tamara from NHK. The EU president will visit Cyprus tomorrow to facilitate a maritime humanitarian corridor. What is Israel's plan or the latest development for bringing humanitarian aid by sea? We are constantly exploring new ways to get aid into Gaza in a way that makes sure that aid reaches the people who need it uh, and that Hamas cannot steal it. Uh, in that regard, we've been working on several new avenues since the beginning of the war. The aid convoys uh, in cooperation with the private sector, the airdrops in cooperation with foreign air services, constantly exploring other ways. Israel's policy is that we want to see aid reach the people who need it, make sure that Hamas cannot steal it. Uh, that is why we are working to bypass Hamas, to bypass UNRWA, the Hamas front that has been covering up for Hamas's militarization of its own facilities and hiring uh, terrorists. But as for the specific question of uh, the Maritime Corridor, I have no uh, immediate update on any latest developments. Thank you. Question from Melanie Lidman at AP. Is there any update on permits for Palestinians from the West Bank so that they can enter Jerusalem for worship during Ramadan? Uh, Melanie, no, I know particular information about access for Palestinians from Judea and Samaria. Uh, as I said, following the meeting that the Prime Minister chaired with all elements of the security forces, uh, it was decided that during the first week of Ramadan, the entry of worshippers to the Temple Mount will be permitted, similar to numbers in previous years, and there will be uh, a follow-up weekly assessment uh, to take consideration of uh, security needs and public safety concerns. Thank you. Question from Sean Dakin at The Independent. David Cameron has said that the UK's patience is running thin with respect to aid arriving into Gaza. This suggests it's not moving fast enough. Can more be done to ensure protesters are not hindering aid crossing the northern borders with Israel? Uh, Israel's policy is that we want to see aid enter Gaza to reach the people who need it and make sure that Hamas cannot steal it. That is why the amount of aid going into Gaza has increased, reaching a record 277 trucks just the other day, facilitating the operation of 20 bakeries inside Gaza. That's doubled in the last two weeks, providing two and a half million loaves of bread and pita for people inside Gaza. Of course, whenever anyone tries to interfere with the implementation of that policy, that will be dealt with. We think it is unfortunate uh, that certain officials appear to have been led astray by misinformation about what Israel's policy is, led astray perhaps by international officials that are not neutral observers, uh, that have picked a side in this war and are trying to end this war in a way that leaves Hamas on its feet and saves it from the war that it started. We want to see aid reach the people who need it, and so we repeat uh, our statement. There is excess capacity at Israel's crossings, and all nations that want to send food, water, medicine, or shelter equipment should send it, as Britain has done with the corridor from Jordan, and we will facilitate its entry into Gaza. The problem is not getting aid into Gaza. The problem is the distribution inside Gaza. And as I said, that's because the UN has been relying on UNRWA, a Hamas front that has been covering up for how it's been infiltrated by Hamas. It's been relying on UNRWA. It's been relying on Hamas for protection. That mechanism has failed. That is why we call on the UN to activate agencies that have been active in other war zones doing disaster relief. They have the expertise to deliver aid. We're working with the private sector, working with airdrops as well. Critical that aid reach the people who need it and make sure that Hamas cannot steal it. Send the aid, we'll get it in. Thank you. Question from Mark Weiss at Khan Radio. Uh, is it possible that Israel will order the evacuation of civilians from Rafah during Ramadan? Um, the uh, army has presented a plan to the uh, Prime Minister regarding ways that we intend to mitigate harm to civilians. We think it is tragic that instead of cooperating with our efforts to set up shelters in what we designated as a safe zone 
UN agencies have effectively funneled them into Hamas strongholds, thereby making themselves complicit with Hamas's human shield strategy, keeping them in harm's way in places where Hamas can continue to hide behind them. Uh, we want to achieve a framework for a temporary pause in the fighting that will enable us to get hostages out. Uh, but this war will end ultimately with the total dismantling of Hamas's military and governing uh, infrastructure. Uh, again, we want to see a pause in the fighting to get hostages uh, out. We are giving that uh, an opportunity because we need to do everything to get the hostages out. Uh, but ultimately, uh, this war will continue with the total destruction of Hamas's governing and military infrastructure. I'll just add, the reason we are talking about potential ground operation in Rafah is that over the course of the war, we have already dismantled 18 out of 24 Hamas battalions. The Khan Yunis Brigade effectively dismantled on its last feet. And that means the remainder of Hamas's organized military force is inside uh, Rafah. Uh, and that must be dismantled to ensure that the atrocities of 10-7 can never happen again. Thank you. Question from Joel Pollock at Breitbart News. The world has pressured Israel not to attack Hamas in Rafah, citing humanitarian concerns. In the delay, the humanitarian crisis in Gaza has deepened. Wouldn't it be more humanitarian to enter Rafah uh, and finish Hamas and end the war more quickly? Well, we think that there are many things that people who are genuinely concerned with the humanitarian situation can do. Uh, first and foremost, an option that has uh, evaded many people's attention, calling on Hamas to surrender. If Hamas lays down its arms, turns over its war criminals and releases the hostages immediately, this war can end tomorrow and we can begin a process of de-radicalization and peaceful reconstruction. Uh, that is what anyone concerned with humanitarian uh, issues should do. Uh, as I said previously, in relation to UN officials pressuring Israel not to move against the remaining four Hamas battalions, they have a choice that they can make. Do they want to try to save Palestinian civilians or do they want to save Hamas? They cannot save Hamas from the war that it started on 10-7, but there is a great deal that they can do in order to mitigate harm to civilians who are suffering from this war that Hamas brought on them. Uh, and we urge them to cooperate with efforts to get civilians out of harm's way. As they know full well, and people in Gaza know full well, Hamas declared this war, and our response is a war against Hamas, not against the Palestinian people, not against the people of Gaza. Uh, thank you. Second question from Joel Pollock at Breitbart News on Gaza Aid. Can you clarify, is the poor performance of UNRWA in distributing aid a result of UNRWA's own incompetence, or is it, re is it a result of Israel's actions, including an effort to shut down the organization? UNRWA was doing a cataclysmically bad job of distributing aid even before the recent revelations that over a dozen uh, UNRWA staff took part in the October 7 massacre and that the whole organization is riddled with Hamas and Islamic Jihad operatives. And the reason is UNRWA is not an aid agency. It's not an aid agency. Its main job is to provide education, health care and welfare services to Palestinians in Gaza, to those falsely uh, classified as refugees, fourth, fifth generation refugees using a different definition from the UN agency, but we'll put that to one side. But its job on October 6th was not to be an aid distribution agency in a war zone. The UN has those mechanisms and the agencies on the ground that have been doing that have been doing a better job than UNRWA which has been covering up for Hamas's theft of aid, covering up for Hamas's militarization of its own facilities, covering up uh, for the way that Hamas has infiltrated its organization. Uh, moreover, we know that UNRWA has been relying on Hamas for protection of the convoys. This was something the uh, State Department spokesman said just last week, that one of the reasons in the U.S. assessment that UNRWA has been failing to do a bad job is because Israel has been targeting Hamas and because UNRWA was relying on Hamas to secure those convoys. So that is why we are urging the UN to activate 
other mechanisms that are not in cahoots with, complicit with, in bed with terrorists. They have experience in other war zones getting and distributing aid and doing disaster relief. Those mechanisms have to be implemented. And from the private sector convoys to the airdrops in northern Gaza, we are continually exploring new efforts to get aid to the people who need it and make sure that Hamas cannot steal it. Thank you. Question from Hannah Julian at the Jewish Press. Uh, Gaza journalist Mohammed Salame was killed yesterday in an airstrike on a home in Deir el Bala. Can you comment on this? Also, there are reports an Israeli delegation is returning to Cairo for more hostage talks. Can you confirm? Um, your question about Deir el I have no information on that, I'm afraid. Specific operational questions, you should refer your question to the IDF spokespersons unit. Uh, as for hostage negotiations, we don't conduct negotiations through the media. Uh, when there is white smoke, we will announce it, hopefully soon. Uh, but until then, we're not giving a, an ongoing commentary about negotiations when uh, human lives hang in the balance. Thank you. That was the last question. Okay. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, please keep safe and, uh, and see, you, uh, see you later. Thank you very much.